At the start of the year, the Liberal Democrats released uh, new research finding that 11,000 homes across the country have been empty for 10 years or more. Just wondering what prompted this research? Well, what prompted it was a worry about lack of housing and the appalling problems now confronting young families trying to get into the housing market and all those in the private rented sector faced with unaffordable rents. There, there is a housing crisis and the market is dysfunctional in all kinds of ways. Uh, and one of the oddities and one of the problems is that while we have acute scarcity of property, there is a large amount of property that is under-occupied or unoccupied and we've found you know, I think 11,000 uh, homes that have been left empty for 10 years and because there's hundreds of thousands that have been left empty for shorter periods of time. Now in some cases there are good reasons for it but in other cases this is property that's never going to be brought into circulation unless somebody does something about it. And there is le legislation um, for um, enabling local authorities to acquire empty property to renovate it and, re uh, and let it. And what we discovered that was that very, very few councils were actually using the powers which they were entitled to use. And we want that changed. And we want to have a, a, an obligation on local authorities to demonstrate how they're going to make use of their stock of empty homes. Yeah. What the research found was that very few local councils are using the available powers to requisition properties left empty for at least six months. But what should the government be doing to change this situation? It may be that actually the, there needs to be some revision in, through second legislation yeah. in how the orders are applied because they do seem to be rather kind of legalistic and a bit bureaucratic so it may need a smoother, sharper process yeah. to enable us to have. Considering your findings and the fact that there are over 400 luxury towers in London's development pipeline despite a slump in sales last year, do you think the housing market is currently working for people as a whole? It isn't, and, but the, the question is how do you get at that problem in a practical way? Um, th there are, uh, you know, there is a council tax surcharge on um, uh, empty property or second homes, uh, but I think it could be much more penal and create a real disincentive. I mean, if you had 300% council tax or even more, um, you could potentially shift a certain amount of this luxury accommodation. I mean. It, Price incentives only work to some extent because some of those people are, you know, the, the money here is for questionable reasons or they, they just see Britain as a safe haven for political risk back home, so a bit of extra tax won't deter them. But, uh, you know, if it was tough, then, you know, we would get some of that property moved on. Yeah. Actually, the Mayor's Homes for Londoners report indicates that the number of empty homes in London is actually at its lowest level since the 1970s at around 0.6%. So while it may be symbolic of inequality in the housing market, is it actually that big a deal? Well, it's, 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 it's part of a, 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 a much bigger picture, and it's not surprising, given the enormous pressure on the housing stock, that you know, such empty property as there is, is is being better used. I mean, it doesn't surprise me at all, but there's still a lot of it, uh, and we've got to deal with it. But of course, it's very much second in priority to getting a lot more houses built, and not just houses built, but houses that are affordable for people on you know, roughly average incomes. That's the big gap at the moment. And in addition, lack of social housing for those who are not going to be able to afford to rent or buy commercially. And the argument is often made that the problem is purely one of undersupply. Would you agree with this assessment? Or? It's not solely a matter of undersupply. Yeah. There is a supply and demand problem. Yeah. And uh, we do have a shortage of supply relative to what's needed to keep the market stable in the long run. I mean, we mm -hmm. should probably, most of the estimates are between 250, 300,000 a year, to let's say 270, 275. And actually, in recent years, we've been half that. I know it's, it's in the last few years there's been something of a, a boom in house building, but it's well, well short of that level. I mean, I was first active in politics in Glasgow uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, and we were getting 400,000 houses a year built, and many, many more than today for a smaller population. So, you know, there were, there were particular reasons for that, which would do with slum clearance and wartime damage, but even then, we're way below our construction potential.
Does it ignore the impact of relatively unrestricted investment from overseas speculators? Yes, it's, 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 it's difficult sometimes, obviously, to pick out people's motives. Um, and, you know, Britain should be open to foreign investment in, as a general proposition. I'm broadly in favour of that. Uh, and some of the overseas investment of housing is genuinely heading to the stock in a, in a, in a welcome way. But th there has undoubtedly been, particularly in London, not exclusively, but mainly in London, um, house building, luxury accommodation, largely for people to hold it as a store of value and not to be lived in. And that is clearly uh, unacceptable because the land could otherwise be used for proper housing. Well, what would you suggest can be done to, to manage that sort of the, the foreign residential real estate? Investment? Well, the, the, there is an issue about planning permission in the first place and local authorities being clear what the housing is for, making sure there is a commitment to housing local people. and local authorities could be more um, uh, clear about what they're trying to achieve. And, but you also have to have penalties. I mean, if property, if property isn't utilised, there should be a, a tax on it. And certainly we're advocating 300% council tax. And that isn't, of course, just luxury housing in London, but, you know, there are some, some rural areas, you know, the Lake District Council, uh, Cornwall, Wales, you know, there is enormous anger about property that is simply held for investment purposes and use once or twice a year and that's where the council tax impact could be significant. Do you think the coalition government's policy of quantitative easing fueled the influx of capital to London's property market and perhaps increased the inflation of the land values? Well, it, it, it probably did. Um, I mean I, I would nonetheless defend the policy. I mean we have to remember the context that it was a position where the banks were broken, they have been um, badly damaged by the financial crisis, they were not lending. Um, that was one problem. In addition, the government had very large deficits and debts, so the traditional Keynesian policies, which you normally have used in those conditions, couldn't apply. So the central banks had to use very aggressive monetary policy, which they, it wasn't just in the UK, it wasn't coalition government, it was done in the US and still is operating in the Eurozone and Japan. And it has had the effect of staving off the most appalling um, recession. I mean, we did get a downturn, but nothing like as bad as in um, post-crash America in 1929. Uh, monetary policy has been used to keep economies going. It's largely succeeded in doing that. But one of the side effects of, is that some of the liquidity has been pumped into the housing market and stock and, and of course other assets, equities, uh, and uh, the housing market is overpriced as a result. And there is some evidence to suggest that the house prices are driven by affordability rather than just supply and demand. Do you think that initiatives like Help to Buy actually make the situation worse? Yes, I think that Help to Buy is an absolutely terrible idea um, and you're quite right, supply and demand of course matters, but if you're looking at any particular point in time, the annual increment to supply through building is less than 1% of the market. So, I mean, what's actually, what is much more um, important is affordability and access to credit. I mean, it's affordability is one side of it, but, but access to credit is the other. And if you have very loose um, lending, which is what we had in the run-up to the financial crisis, the market gets out of control, as, as indeed happened. And that's beginning to happen again, uh, and it's made much, much worse by help to buy. I mean, all the research I've seen on help to buy shows that it's bid up prices and actually forced more people out of the market than were brought into it as a result of access to their subsidy. Uh, I feel I very strongly, privately and publicly in government that this was a terrible idea and I, nothing has happened since to believe that I was wrong. In light of recent events uh, with Carillion, do you think there was enough concern raised about relying too heavily on big firms such as those? Well, in retrospect, it's clear that it was. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that until quite close to the death of Carillion, Nobody was going around systematically warning about this. I mean, I think we, we had spotted um, after last July that there was a serious issue with this particular company and the profit warnings, and we were urging government to start looking at this seriously at that point. 
But I think the bigger question about whether Britain has become over-dependent on a handful of mega companies, in some cases rather questionable business models, paying out large dividends when their pension funds were being uh, you know, underfunded, um, that wasn't picked up and should have been. I, th I think one of the lessons we've learned from it is that First of all, government procurement and oversight of contracts has got to be a lot smarter. And that, that means training civil servants at a higher level to do these things properly. And I thought it also means, I think, ensuring that when you have government procurement for big building contracts, um, we're willing to entertain a larger number of suppliers, tier ones, SMEs, giving them direct access to contracts, not them necessarily working through one big company. And developers take a lot of blame for the housing crisis, but they generally operate on low margins, like really, and regularly go bankrupt. Isn't the reality that successive governments have accepted increasing tax revenues from an increasing population, but have done little to nothing to accommodate those extra people? I think we don't, well, I think many of us now accept that the basic model uh, is flawed, but it's been convenient for successive governments to go along with it. Um, the, the truth is that you know, housing development will only happen in an environment where you get rising prices which are creating a better margin for the, the developers. We know there's large amounts of land is left unoccupied, but, uh, uh, you know, people sitting on land banks because it's improving their balance sheets if prices are going up in the meantime. It's not a good model for maximising the number of houses being built of adequate quality. So we, we do have to change the model um, and I think that probably does mean intelligent forms of state intervention. Um, some of it is um, local councils having greater freedom to borrow to build, you know, the council housing stock which is depleted too far, stopping the right to buy actually which has done terrible damage at the bottom end of the market. But it also means um, Governments reverting perhaps to the kind of new town model, uh, you know, active development, acquiring land cheaply, um, you, know, you know, within garden city type structures or garden villages, however you call it. It could be done through a development corporation or local councils, probably the former. But we do need a different model, simply relying on a handful of um, house building companies, which are acting perfectly rationally. I mean, they're not. You know, within the model and within the system, they're behaving in a completely rational way, but it means undersupply. And there is a Liberal Democrat policy to force house building on public land. How would that work in practice? Well, not just public land. I mean, I think there is one of the points that's now become part of the debate that the compulsory purchase uh, rules, which were, I think, devised around 1959-60, simply don't allow for um, development agencies or councils to acquire land without home value in the way that it's necessary in order to provide an adequate supply. Uh, but in addition, you know, there, there is undoubtedly the case that councils, and for that matter the health service, are sitting on vast amounts of land. It isn't just private developers who've got land banks, you know, councils and um, public authorities do too. And, you know, there's got to be very strong pressure from central government. Um, but a good example is the MOD, uh, which is, you know, it's often been referred to. But there's no penalty on the MOD from holding excess land. And the Treasury should be penalising that, not incentivising it. And you've been a vocal supporter of building on the Greenbelt in the past. Um, yes, I, I think you know, the Green Belt's become something of a religion. Uh, it's actually the concept is a very good one. I mean, we don't, you know, preventing you know, constant build-up. Uh, you know, the, the idea of the Green Belt is something we must fight to preserve. But it's often done in a completely um, mechanical, dogmatic way. I mean, there is some Green Belt that has low amenity, and there are, it's a brown brownfield that should be protected because they've got better status. So I think a bit of flexibility at the margin is important. And when we're talking about green land, um, it's often couched in terms of protecting farmland. And, but actually what is really under threat at the moment are parks and playing fields in urban areas. And that's, that's where the fight should be. 
and just final question to wrap things up. With all your time commitments as Liberal Democrat leader, do you still find enough time to be able to dance? I do, yes. I go, try to go once a week. I, we've got a bit of disruption at the moment with, yeah. with uh, moving the dancing school, moving premises, but I try to go once a week. And I'm no longer able to do what I was doing, which is doing competitions. I used to go to Blackpool and, yeah. and compete, and at least in my age group. Um, but I'm, I haven't got the time to do that. But I try to keep up the once a week practice, yeah. and I've got a great partner and a teacher. Yeah. Ballroom or? Ballroom and Latin. Yeah. Fantastic.